I'm going to pause just for a moment here as participants come into our virtual space. But I will begin the process of uh, expressing my enormous gratitude to, uh, to General Dempsey for joining us in this virtual distinguished speaker series. Um, this is our, our first effort to, uh, to offer something kind of out of season uh, over the summer months where with COVID-19, uh, time, and, time and place seem a little less relevant and we do have the ability to connect with our broader community. And so um, it gives me great pleasure to have General Dempsey join us uh, this evening. And uh, of course, General Dempsey has had a remarkably distinguished career and uh, among other things has served as the 18th chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, is a Duke graduate and is currently serving as a Rubenstein Fellow uh, jointly at the Sanford School and here at the Fuqua School. So General Dempsey, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Bill. It's great to see you. I, I miss, you know, coming, coming on campus, but hopefully that won't last too much longer. And how could I say no to being invited to something called the Distinguished Speaker Series? I mean, you know, I hope I can live up to it, but it was nice to be invited. What, was Dini surprised that, that you were labeled <laughs> as such? <laughs> I think she stays surprised. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I've had the, the great uh, privilege of having a number of conversations with you over the years. And um, not that long ago, we had a conversation uh, about COVID-19. And at that time, we, we talked about... Uh, that, that COVID-19 was this incredible threat to, to health, incredible threat to economic well-being. And your message was in this environment where people are scared, they're anxious, they're uncertain, that we need to give them a sense of belonging. Now, since we spoke, we've added a, a third dimension of this crisis, which is a crisis of values, uh, a crisis where people are asking is there, is there fairness and, and justice in society? Um, and a recognition that as you think about the first two dimensions of this crisis, the, the health crisis and the economic crisis, that this is hitting certain communities disproportionately, in particular the black community and other underrepresented communities. So I'm gonna ask you a, a, a really tough question right out of the gate, which is in this moment, how do we create a sense of belonging for communities that feel so incredibly disenfranchised by what they've seen today and over the, the course of history? Yeah. Well, first of all, I appreciate that you mentioned the fact that these three crises are very much related to each other. And as you, as you said, I, uh, in our previous conversation, tried to, talk to your, those listening to your podcast, that each of them generates a, a, uh, its own kind of fear, but the three of them together can feel almost overwhelming, actually, and that the only antidote to fear is belonging. And so I think that what we've got to do, especially those of us that have a voice and leaders in general, but not just leaders, uh, I think we have to help be sense makers in this moment. You know, we have to help people make sense of what's going on, show them the connections, make not only make sense of things, but help them feel it. You know, I, I just can't imagine the fear of, a, of an African-American mother in this moment about whether it's, it's safe for her children to walk the streets of America. I mean, that's just overwhelming to me. I can't imagine what it's like for them. So sense making, um, is a big is a big part of that. I I also think that there's a, there's an element in this new crisis that will require perseverance. You know, we this is not the first time we've confronted this crisis of values in our country. I was telling you before we came on that when I joined the army in the early '70s, it was an army suffering from the from an unpopular war in Vietnam. But more than that, uh, we had lost our connection to 
the, our, the American people that we served, we were a conscript army and we had, we had just awful race problems and drug problems. And it took us every bit of 10 years in my, in my recollection to, to declare that we had at least made enough progress there we, that, we, that we could declare some degree of success. But those kind of issues don't ever completely go away. And so it takes perseverance. If I have, if I have one thing that gives me, that encourages me, it's that unlike the protests that I've seen in, in my past beginning, of course, you know, with the 1968 notably, um, the protests today are actually quite diverse. I mean, you know, we've got a, we, the population feels as though it is actually interested in solving some of these problems. So the question is, how do we reinforce them in the process and make sure that nobody hijacks this movement for their own purposes? So uh, let me let me switch to the the protests that uh, that have been happening. They you know they continue as we speak, and uh, I, I'm going to reflect on uh, a position that you've taken very publicly, which is that the the military should stay out of of politics, and that that applies to um, whether you're active duty or you're a retired general, where you're still representing the military in your view. And and you actually wrote an editorial uh, saying, you know, as you saw this happening where uh, military leaders were taking sides <clears throat> in the presidential election, you said, stay out, because by by getting into this game, you're harming the current military leaders. Uh, however, in the current environment with the protests that are ongoing, um, you, you spoke out. And uh, I, think, I think to quote you, you, you wrote, um, America is not a battleground. Our fellow citizens are not the enemy. And, uh, and I believe this was in reference to the idea that the military would be invoked in, in the civilian world in dealing with these protests. So what what led you to speak out when your you know your your belief is that really you should not be getting into the the world of politics yeah well first of all i um you know you and i have actually used this phrase together which is we live in unprecedented times <laughs> and and uh, you know regrettably we continue to reinforce that fact so my my discussions back in the 2016 time frame to try to keep in particular retired generals and admirals out of the electoral process and influencing the electorate to the belief that somehow one candidate or the other or one party or the other was more favorable to the military. Fast forward from 16 now to 2020 and the, the, the description of what the military might be asked to do was frankly offensive to me. Uh, as you recall, the description used was dominate the battle space. And, you know, look, the president of the United States can legally call upon the active duty military if the, if the lo local law enforcement and potentially the National Guard are overwhelmed. They should, they should clearly be the, the force of last resort at any time in, in domestic issues, but it's legal. And since the Insurrection Acts of 1807, I think it's been uh, called upon 19 times, if, if I remember my history. Most often with the, at the request of a governor um, who felt that he didn't have the capabilities he needed. The, the issue, though, is when used, they should be used as, again, as an instrument of last resort. And that they shouldn't be portrayed as coming in to dominate anything. They should be portrayed as coming in to settle or stabilize or calm things. And so I wanted to make sure that before the decision was made, that everyone understood the implications. And the implications were that the military could in fact lose the trust and confidence of the people we serve. And secondly, as a result of that loss of trust and confidence, we actually, because we're an all volunteer force, we could find ourselves um, unable to attract the kind of young, talented uh, high school graduates, for the most part, 
that we need every year. The Army alone needs 120,000 young men and women annually to join the, to join the military. And so I thought the stakes were so high that I, I felt I had to speak out. And uh, as it turned out, and without collaboration, by the way, we, the, several of us did at the same time and were accused of conspiring to speak together. You know, frankly, I can assure you that was not the case. We all had our own concerns. Some spoke a little more directly about the personalities involved. I did not do that. I tried to limit myself to the issues and implications. So th this is uh, perhaps a good example of uh, a book you've just written, which is titled No Time for Spectators. And uh, can, you, can you tell us a little bit about that book and, and your belief that you know, we, we can't have people sitting on the sidelines uh, if we're going to, if we're going to make progress in, in, in making this place we live better? Yeah. Let me reflect back to 2017, a, a, a gentleman named Nori Brothman and I, he's a professor at Berkeley. <clears throat> We'd worked together while I was chairman. To, he, he was trying to help me understand how to take hierarchical centralized organizations and decentralize them. Um, and, and both of us, when I retired, had felt like that the last couple of years before 2017, notably 2014, had seen an uptick, really a surge of complexity, surely on the national security front, where that was that single year saw the resurgence or a revanchist Russia with Crimea and Eastern Ukraine. It, it was the year that China began its incursions into the South China Sea and, and the assertion of its rights there in a way that was threatening to our allies. It was the year that Kim Jong-un began to, to uh, use ballistic missile tests as a provocation. It was the year that ISIS as a new radical ideology manifest itself. It was the year that Sony was attacked by hackers and not just in a, a denial of service way, but as a, as a threat uh, or a destructive way to their infrastructure. And we had a pandemic, by the way, that was Ebola in West Africa. And so things got really complex and we decided, you know, as we tried to, to give advice to leaders about how to deal with complexity, we felt the answer to that, the antidote for complexity was inclusion so that you can gain knowledge, gain ownership, gain accountability. That book though was fo firmly focused on giving advice to leaders. And what I decided after that book was published was that I felt the need to address the other side of the equation. That is to say, positive productive relationships are the result of, in my judgment, are the results of, of common expectations between leaders and those who follow them. So, you know, the leaders should have certain expectations of those who follow, but so should the followers have certain expectation of their leaders. And I picked out attributes that I thought were a good start to that, character, loyalty, fundamentals and, and, and sensible skepticism, responsible rebelliousness was, were some of the descriptions I used. But the important point was that if leaders and followers can act consistent with a shared set of expectations, we're going to get better outcomes. And that led to the title of the book being No Time for Spectators. The idea being, you know, in an information saturated, fast paced, intensely scrutinized world, you can become paralyzed. And we can't let that happen. And we can't let it happen now, especially with these three intersecting crises. So you, you mentioned uh, something called responsible rebelliousness. You don't actually find it offensive uh, if, if people disagree with one another. And you don't find it, uh, again, to quote you, disagreement is not disloyalty. And so how, how do we give people the right to register their disagreement, to register their protests and not, not make them feel like they're, you know, we're, we're going to put them at risk for having those, those disagreements? You know, how, how do we get back to peaceful protests and, uh, and responsible rebelliousness? Yeah. Well, let me, let me, before I apply it to the issue of protests and demonstrations, let me just say in terms of the relationship of leaders and followers, if, 
it's first of all, that's one where the leader bears most of the responsibility to make to establish a climate in which people feel comfortable that they can disagree. And I use that phrase, disagreement isn't disloyalty, because by the way, it was one of the things that President Obama and I discussed when I was, uh, I guess, interviewing would be the right phrase to be the, the chairman. And he, and he embraced the idea that he wanted my advice. He made no commitment that he would take it, nor should he have. But he, he wanted to be sure I knew that I had the freedom to give him advice and and that on my end I had an obligation to give it even if I knew it's not what he wanted to hear. See that's where I think you've got this shared responsibility. The climate is established by the leader, but the but the moral courage to actually give advice that you know is counter to what you might think your boss wants to hear is a, a follower's or an advisor's responsibility. Now fast forward. I I you know I say in that chapter of the book that you know, you have to define what it means to be responsibly rebellious. And, you know, there are ways to do that. One of the ways to do it is to, is what's the motivation? Are, you know, are you doing something for the good of the group of the organization or are you doing it for your own self-aggrandizement? And, and secondly, of course, you, you, there, there are limits imposed with common sense ethics, but also law. So to the point of the demonstrations, you know, I think protesting responsibly would be protesting peacefully. And I think you would cross that line if, if you know, if you, if you destroy other people's lives in the process of trying to make your own, your own point. But, but that conversation needs to, be, needs to be had, right, between leaders and followers. And, you know, there are indications around the country. We, we, we typically see the, the ones that go badly. But I think around the country, there are, there's plenty of evidence of responsible rebelliousness. So I know, I know that the, the flag is very meaningful to you. Uh, you know, th this is a very powerful symbol uh, and uh, brings, brings forward deep emotions. Uh, and yet some of the protests, uh, especially in the world of sports, have, have involved um, kneeling during the national uh -huh. anthem, you know, not, not saluting the, the, the flag, whatever that might be. Uh, the, the NFL has gotten themselves in a lot of trouble in terms of how they handle that. And the NBA, on the other hand, um, seemed to end US, USA basketball. So I'll just mention for our, our viewers that that you are both a, a special advisor to the NBA commissioner, and and I believe you're the 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 head of uh, the the chair of USA Basketball. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. So chairman of the board. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so how you know how do you grapple with this in terms of your your personal feelings, but also uh, ab about how you see the flag and respect for the flag, but also your respect for people to disagree and and protests in a peaceful manner. Yeah. Well, let me begin by first saying something that I know there are veterans out there that disagree with me about, and that is, I don't consider someone kneeling during the national anthem to be an affront to those who have served. In fact, you know, look, when the, the United States military serves all of the people, and that includes the people who agree with us or whom we agree with them, and the people with whom we disagree or they disagree with us. I mean, we have a responsibility to understand that, that we serve all of the people. And therefore, if some of the people decide to use the national anthem for a, let's call it a, a uh, non-disruptive protest, like kneeling, as opposed to screaming or yelling or, you know, or doing uh, disrespectful things, I don't consider it an affront to the military. And I think it's important for me to say that as the jumping off point here. Secondly, I, I think, you know, that, that, you know, this is a dichotomy of can and should. I think that, well, I know that people can kneel if they choose to do it. I think they should stand respectfully. Now, why do I think that? Not, not because I disagree with their concerns. But I see that 90 seconds, and it takes about 90 seconds for the national anthem to be played. 
I personally see that 90 seconds as an opportunity to focus on the things that unite us or, or, or can unite us or should unite us. But the point is, for that 90 seconds, I choose to focus on the things that unite us, knowing that for the other 23 hours, 58 and a half minutes of the day, I'm probably going to be bombarded with evidence and suggestions of the things that pull us apart. Mm. So I choose, and by the way, how often do we hear the national anthem anymore? You know, it used to be pretty frequently, actually. Now I think you'd be hard pressed to, to think through when you heard it last, unless you were at a sporting event. That's just the way things have gone. And so, you know, I see it as an opportunity to, to focus on what brings us apart. But I also recognize that there are likely to be people who can't focus on the opportunity because they're suffering from such a, an injustice that they can't get beyond that for a moment. And so what I think the NBA has done, in my judgment, correctly, is they have a rule on the books that says, you know, you will stand for the national anthem. By the way, that rule was put in place mostly because about a fourth of the NBA are, are international players and we wanted everybody to stand. So it wasn't aimed at any one group in particular. But the rule stays on the book, but the commissioner has the authority to impose punishment or not. And as long, and, and what we've seen is that as long as that, that things are non-disruptive and respectful in their own way, um, there are cases where he won't impose punishment. And, and so what that gives him a chance to do, I, I, but I'm not speaking for Adam, but I, I believe this to be the case. What it gives him a chance to do is recognize that, you know, Time is not one you know, single continuum. Rather, there are events that impact on things as you go. And when there are moments in our history now, our recent history, when things are so emotionally supercharged and, 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 and that you know, with people, real people who have real feelings for these things, who could find themselves in an impossible situation, that he can understand that and he can deal with those as individual instances while leaving the rule in place. So uh, I wanna go back to uh, another comment that you made that uh, as, as you uh, spent time serving, um, there was a big transition within the, the, the military from, uh, from uh, a, a conscript based service to volunteer mm -hmm. and that there were really huge issues that, that you had to cope with. So uh, the, the military is, is very diverse and, and you have created a sense that you're all on the same team and, and you, all, you all belong in the same team. So can you help us understand that as you reflect on what the military has done right and, and what has not gone so well, I think that uh, the, the, the different branches have both been highlighted and held up with, with heat around issues of bias and discrimination. Um, so, so what has gone right that we can learn from and, and what has gone wrong that we can learn from in your view? Yeah. Well, it starts when we, in our in our recruiting i mean we you know we we want to our our standard is we want to reflect the society in which we serve or with whom we serve and so as we recruit we typically will look to make sure that we are recruiting across the country so we get a diversity of you know of, of the geographic richness of this country but also the groups that form this country and so we monitor that and, and, you know, we, we just, when we succeed or fail to, to see that we are, you know, uh, percentage wise accounting for those groups of people, you know, we scrutinize what, what went wrong, you know, and then the next cycle, we, we try to, we try to overcome that. Secondly, from the time we get them to basic training, the first thing we do in the morning and the last thing we do at night is we make sure they know they're part of the team. And we have that because you can't ask someone, I'll take the army as an example, to, to walk out of a base camp in Iraq and Afghanistan unless they trust a man or woman to their left and right, unless they feel a sense of belonging with the team. 
same thing with strapping some young man or woman into a fighter jet pilot or into a fighter or we're asking 120 young men and women to go down in the submarine. I mean, you've got to have that sense of belonging that is hardwired into the organization. Um, the third thing I would say we do is that we, we try to also monitor and nurture leaders so that at the leadership level, not just at the, at the enlisted level, we, we also reflect the society in which we serve. Now you ask, you know, what do we, have we done well and what have we perhaps not done so well? I think we've done well at the enlisted level of reflecting the society we serve. I think at the mid-grade officer level, it starts to break down a bit. And by the time we get to the most senior levels, we're not as representative as we should be. And there's many reasons for that, uh, notably that there's, a, there's kind of a tried and true path. And it generally runs through the combat specialties, not the logistic specialties. And what we've found, for example, over the course of time is that young African-American men were, and in some cases continue to be drawn into the logistics fields because they have mentors there. They see a reflection of themselves. And so it's hard to break that cycle um, where, you know, people will follow their mentors rather than follow the path that might allow them to be competitive to be a general officer or an admiral, a flag officer. So, you know, what, what we try to do then is we, we try to appeal at the very beginning of the process, places like West Point, Duke ROTC. We try to appeal to young men and women to follow that path if they, if they like to be competitive later to be a general or an admiral. But the problem is if you're talking to a 22 year old about what might happen when they get to be 45, you know, it's, it's a challenge, but, but that path is tried and true. The last thing I'll tell you is we really want to be considered a meritocracy. And I, and I think, you know, to, 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 to a, a very high degree, we are a meritocracy. There are just things you have to do in order to be promoted and placed into positions of increasing responsibility. But the, the last thing I want to say, Bill, is we, we never get complacent about this. I mean, you know, we know that we, know that, that, we have to, we, that we have earned the trust of the American people, but that we have to earn it every day. And that motivation to earn the trust of the American people every day is, I think, what causes us to be introspective and self-critical when we see that we haven't done what we think is best for not only the country, but the force itself, the profession. So one of, one of the elements of, of that meritocracy that you referred to is that, that, for example, if you want to have access to certain roles, you need to go back to graduate school. Right. You chose to come to Duke for graduate school. And, and I have to believe this is probably a somewhat unusual choice, but uh, you, you have a master's degree uh, in English literature. And so tell us what, what it was about that experience that has stuck with you as a leader. Well, I, the, fortunately for me, I was actually selected uh, initially to go back and teach in the English department at West Point because the, the way the military academies generally work, they're all a bit different, is that there's a percentage of the faculty that's permanently there, tenured, if you will. And then about a, a, a third to, to, you know, to 50% of it is rotational. I might have the percentages wrong, but there's a rotational faculty. We intentionally bring men and women out of the field army, if you will, send them to graduate school, bring them back in. And that's bringing back to West Point to be instructors for three years. And that's so that, you know, the cadets have access to current information about what the army's like and what it's doing i got one of those slots and so i went to i came to duke got my master's in english literature and went back so i i'd like to i'd like to tell you that i was somehow prescient and really thoughtful about the whole thing but the first thing i wanted to do is go to grad school at a place that had a good basketball team and then go back and teach at west point and that happened to be a pretty good fit when you think about it with Duke and then back to the English department. But I will tell you that it's one of the best decisions I ever made because you know, it, you know what the, the 
teaching literature does a couple of things for you that become even more important the more senior you become. First of all, you get you you become a better communicator, both in writing, clearly in writing, because you know a, gra a graduate degree in English literature is really an exercise in survival writing when you come right down to it. And then the second thing is you know speaking. You know you learn to think in terms of metaphor, which is really helpful when you're trying to explain something. For example, some of my most successful moments with President Obama were when, you know, he'd say, look, I've read all the briefing materials. I've sat through the PowerPoint slides. You know, how do you want, how should I think about this? And I'd find some metaphor. You know, sometimes it would be a sports metaphor. Other times it might be a weather metaphor. Whatever it was, it was, well, Mr. President, here's really the issue here. And it was very helpful to me to, to help him understand things, which is one of the, uh, as you and I have discussed, one of the responsibilities of an advisor is to make sure that you can help the person you're advising think. And then the last thing is, I think, is that, you know, you, you kind of travel around the world in literature and, and you get a glimpse, not just of, of, of the facts that define another civilization, another religion, another, you know, another political movement, whatever it is, you actually get a chance to feel what those groups go through. So reading as I did about, you know, Irish history or reading as I did about the Islamic faith before I went to Iraq and Afghanistan, it, it, it allowed me to feel what I was about to be asked to do in a way that I found quite fascinating, but also very important. So I've, uh, I've talked to you about this before, but uh, on your website, I'm struck uh, with a quote that you have uh, from Yates. You, you focused on Yates uh, in your time as a graduate student, and uh, I don't have it written in front of me, but I think it's something like, uh, talent perceives differences, genius unity. That's exactly so, it, yeah. So uh, tell me, why does that quote speak to you, uh, and it's been so sticky for all these years? Yeah, I, you know, I, 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 because I've actually found it to be true. You know, you, you can, you can, we've all worked for people who will, will focus on the differences among us, you know, and, and by the way, that, that doesn't always have to be pejorative. I mean, it, it does take a certain amount of talent to discern and identify differences and then try to build build teams out of those differences. But real genius, you know, the, the people that I've worked for and I was able to say, I wanna be like that leader. They have managed to, to inside of their team to encourage a, a, a unity that makes that team extraordinary, not just good, makes it extraordinary. And, uh, and you know, Mike, Coach Kane, I talk about this all the time about you know how do you how do you get from good to great i i think that that one way to think about it is that yates quote you know you get from good to great by making sure that your team is unified uh much better than the sum of its individual parts so it it speaks to me because it seems very team fuqua like uh in that uh, as as we think of Team Fuqua, the, the goal is to bring out the best from one another and to get them to, to work with common purpose to, to do something great. So as you think about all your experiences in, in leading so many different people over the years, what, what advice can you, can you give to uh, the people in, uh, in this virtual session around how, how have you found it most effective bringing out the best from people around you? Well, there's some, you know, there's some habits really that I think uh, help that a lot. You know, one of them is, is the willingness to be a, a good listener. Uh, you know, I, I, I may have told you this story. I always talk to my classes about it, but I, I used to carry a card around when I was serving uh, on active duty and especially the more senior I became and the card said simply when is the last time you allowed someone junior to you to change your mind and you know when you get to be the chairman you you know you're whether you want to be or not you're kind of an intimidating uh, force and so uh, 
you know, you really have to make it very clear that you're willing to listen. Second thing, I I always knew in when I would be approached by someone who was working for me. Now, mind you, the Joint Staff's probably 2,000 um, civilians and military, all, you know, all kind of in roughly from, the demographic would be roughly from age 35 to 50, let's say. And, you know, in a, in a given year, they might see the chairman once or twice in the halls of the Pentagon, and they might brief him once in a three-year tour. And what I was always very cognizant of uh, is that when, when, first of all, when someone would be coming in to brief me, uh, my executive officer in the out of well, I knew exactly what he would do. He'd grab them and say, look, you got 10 minutes. I want you in and I want you out so I can keep the chairman on schedule. And so they were, they were, all, they were nervous already to, about the fact that they, had, they were coming to see me. And secondly, now they got the XO, who's a full colonel normally, or Navy captain, breathing down their neck, threatening them you know, with extinction if they don't get in and get out. And so they'd come in and you could just tell they were, you know, they were nervous and, you know, they'd want to launch right into the briefing. And so what I always did is I, I would just sit there and they'd launch into the briefing and I'd say, wait, wait a minute, who are you? You know, and they'd they'd look at me like I'd probably lost my mind. And I'd say, no, I'm serious. Who are you? Where do you live? Are you married? Do you have kids? You know, in DC, you always have to ask, how's your commute? You know, (laughs) so, but what I would try to do is disarm them a bit to see me not as this, you know, you know, like in the movie, The Wizard of Oz, you know, behind the curtain. I wanted them to really appreciate that, you know, it wasn't too much, it wasn't too long ago that I was you. And you know now I'm the chairman and you're you, but I need you. I need you to help me. And I want you to know you can help me, you know? And we need to have a conversation, not, you know, not, a, you know, kind of a dialogue of the deaf, as they say. And so, um, you know, that was the second thing. The last thing I'll tell you that I just really believe in my heart is, is a quote from a book. It's, a, it's actually a work of fiction, you know, back to literature written by a a man named Anton Meyer. The book is titled Once an Eagle. And it's really about the, it's about two military leaders. It it happens to be about World War II, most notably. And one military leader is is a very aggressive, ambitious uh, leader, corrosive. He, He just wants to get to the top. And by the way, he makes it to the top but he leaves a trail of broken spirits behind him. The other one also makes it very high up in rank, but he's very humble. He's approachable. He's, you know, he's, uh, he's, he's just, again, the kind of leader you'd like to think you are and certainly you'd like to think you could be. And at the end of the book, this positive leader has a protege who says to him, how do I get to be the kind of leader you are? Uh, You know, and, and, it's, it was a great question. You know, what you don't want to get asked as a general is, hey, how do you get to be a general? You know, or how do you get to be a CEO? I mean, that, that, that's a question that takes you into a cul-de-sac and you never get out of it. But the right question is, how do I get to be a leader like you? And his answer was, well, he was talking to a captain. He said, look, if you ever have to make a choice between being a good officer or a good person, be a good person. And I thought it was so profound, especially after you've, after you've read this book about what he had accomplished in his career and how, for him to say that one thing that he really felt like he got right was he was a good person. You know, I, you know, it sounds a little bit Pollyannish, maybe in particular in the environment we're in right now, but I do think you know if we all had that instinct to to and 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 if we were honest enough with each other to say, I wonder if people around me consider me a good person and if the answer to that was yes then you know let's keep it up and if the answer to that is no that it would that might actually change something we'd be a lot better off so i i have to believe that over the the course of your career you've been in a position where you have had to make many difficult decisions yeah and and has that has that mantra gone through your head and helped you get through those decisions in terms of you know, be you know make a decision where you will be a good person has that helped guide you Abs- yes absolutely and you know and you know this but and 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 we teach this as well at Fuqua. you know the the 
the, the more senior you become, the more ambiguity creeps into your life. You know, all the, all the black and white decisions, all the easy decisions are stripped away. Somebody else made those decisions long before they get to you. And so you are faced with a whole bunch of ambiguity in your life. And, and, you know, what I tell people is that character is kind of the last defense of a good decision. You know, you'll get all the information you can possibly get. And, and, and by the way, nowadays, you actually can decide, you know, you can be, again, you can become paralyzed because you, you continue to believe that if you have that, that one exquisite piece of information, you, that's what you really need. And, you know, you're in this, you're in this kind of never ending hunt for the perfect answer and it can paralyze you. And so, you know, I think what has to happen is you got to understand when you have enough information to make the decision. And then you apply your character to it. What do you, who are you? What do you believe? Again, because by that time, if you're in the senior position, it's, it's more ambiguity than clarity. And I do think in those moments, as I said, character becomes the safety net for a good decision. And, and at least that's what I've tried to, to tell people and to do myself. So uh, in, in your book, uh, No Time for Spectators, as well as in our conversation tonight, you've, you've made the distinction between leaders and followers. And, uh, and so I'm curious, as you think about the skills that are needed to be a, a great leader and the skills that are needed to be a great follower and, and be a trusted advisor, do those map onto one another or are there really, do you need to take a step into a new domain to transition from follower to leader? I think they, I do think they, they map on to each other, especially in terms of things like values. I think they map very comfortably onto that. But then there's also some techniques, of, for example, of being a trusted advisor. I mean, you know, you have to understand how the person you're advising absorbs information you know let's face it some people read some people love powerpoint you know some people love conversation and you know you as an advisor have to adapt yourself to that not the other way around you know i i can't tell you how many times i've seen i i used to make it very clear that i just don't like powerpoint i think it's by the way, a lot of people do. I'm not being critical and I don't want to get in trouble with Bill Gates. But I also think that, you know, for me, it, it, it numbs me. It just, you know, and then you say, well, you can only bring five slides. And so now they turn into quadrant slides and, you know, you can, and then they, they change the font from 12 to 10 so they can jam more information on there. I, it just doesn't do anything to, to me. But I do know that there are people who actually respond to it well. But, but the point is, I always try to understand how does the person I'm advising, how do they learn best? And then it's my responsibility to, to do that. Secondly, I, I always wanted to know, as I was advising President Obama, for example, what, you know, before I'd go over to the White House, I'd call either the National Security Advisor, I'd call the Chief Staff of the White House, and I'd say, hey, how, how's the president doing today? You know, what's, what's he got on his plate? And, you know, the first couple of times they'd say, why do you want to know? And, you know, a little suspicion, but I'd say, here's what I want to know. You know, I've, I've got some issues I'm going to have to get in front of him, but I want to do those at a time when I know I can gain his attention. And if he's up to his ears in, you know, health care or up to his ears in midterm elections or up to his ears in the budget, and I'm trying to talk about troop levels in Afghanistan, we're going to talk, we're just going to, we're going to talk past each other. And then the last thing is, you know, the, at some of the attributes that I talk about in the book come into play, like, like loyalty, you know. Um, you know, if you're advising someone, you know, they want to know whether if you don't get the answer you want, you know, are you going to go away and, you know, be critical behind their back? Uh, you know, I, there was a phrase I tried to use often in meetings where I, I, the phrase was, say it in the room. And I'd say I did that because even dealing with the Joint Chiefs, you know, the head of the Air Force, Army, Navy, Marines, Coast Guard, I could tell sometimes that if we were talking about issues, especially contentious issues, you know, like women in combat, things like that, I could tell if they were holding something back. And I'd say, look, you know, don't wait until you get back to your office and, and tell your executive officer what a dumb the chairman, <laughs> the chairman is today. Say it in the room. If you really think I'm, I'm on the wrong path, for God's sakes, tell me, you know, 
and then let's work it out. So I think those things, um, you know, which are a little bit mechanical, I suppose, are helpful in that, in that way. So uh, as, you, as you see others that you're working with, what, what kind of cues do you look for in thinking you know, that's someone who has real potential as a leader? And can you, can you get that uh, from someone who, whose job is to be a follower in the moment? Um, and yeah. so I'm, I'm just kind of curious what, what signs you, you look for when, when you are evaluating someone's capability. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, as I became chairman and had, you know, a, a personal staff that, that actually helped me, you know, the, the major part of the staff or the, the kind of the general staff, if you will, would tee up issues. And then the, I had a personal staff that was very good at, because they'd gotten to know me at refining issues and suggesting ways I might think about it differently. And so I, I, let me answer your question because I always tried to pick that small personal staff among those who I thought could be the chairman someday. So I picked a couple of Navy SEALs. I had an Air Force pilot. I had, I had an, an armor officer from the Army. I, you know, I had submariners. I, I had a very diverse group and I personally interviewed them. And what I was looking for was they really, I wanted them to be inquisitive. You know, you know if, we're, if we're riding across the river to a meeting in the White House or to Capitol Hill, I enjoyed them engaging me and questioning why I thought about one thing or another in a particular way. So, you know, I would try in the interview to figure out, is this someone who's going to be inquisitive or is this just a, a timekeeper? You know, hey, sir, you got to be here, then you got to be there and you got to be in this uniform and we're going to feed you at some point. So, you know, get ready to open your mouth when that time comes. I wanted somebody to be really inquisitive about what does it mean to be the chairman of the Joint Chiefs? Secondly, uh, humility. You know, you, people come into an interview and if, if they came in to try to convince me that, except that, you know, they're not old enough yet, they'll be the chairman because they've clearly got the potential and the capability. I'm, I believe in humility, but that's not to say I don't believe in ambition. And what I would talk to them about is, look, I want you to be ambitious. M Mike krzyzewski has got another great one. You know, he, he's, he talks about the fact that when he was coaching the Olympics, a lot of people said, you're going to have to get these players to leave their egos at the door. And he took exactly the opposite approach. He said, no, I, he would tell these, you know, LeBron James and Kobe and Kyrie and, you know, you, you know, fill in the blanks. He'd say, I want you to bring your ego in. It's just that when you get it in here, I want you to use it on behalf of the team. So I, 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 I would always try to find that balance in a, in a person, a man or a woman between ambition and humility. And there's ways you can, with the right kind of question, you can kind of coax, you can kind of coax that out. And then, you know, back to the good person thing, I'd, I'd want to know something about, you know, their family and, and them and, you know, what, What's the, what's the last thing you read just to see if they actually read, uh, you know, but, um, <laughs> but there's ways, you know, to, to take the resume will tell you what they've done, you know, but what I wanted to know in the interview was how they do it, you know, because, you know, you know, the old phrase winning matters, but in my judgment to include with USA basketball, it's not just that we win that matters. It's how we win because, we're on a world stage and we want to represent our country the right way. So as, as far as I can tell, uh, you've been flawless uh, throughout your career, uh, <laughs> but is it possible that uh, you could tell us about a time when you feel like you made a mistake that, that really was not the kind of leadership behavior that, that you expect of yourself uh, yeah. Without revealing any state secrets, uh, sure. but but you know what? When do you feel like you you made a serious leadership mistake, and how did how did you learn from that? Well, you, you know, although I've been telling you all the positive attributes that should exist in a good leader, I mean, look, we're all human too, and so you know, uh, and I'm Irish, by the way, and I mentioned that because Irish men and women generally have a bit of a temper and you know there were moments when 
when that temper would manifest itself. Uh, and I, but I'll tell you this, 100% of the time I regretted it because it, it just shuts people down, you know, uh, and especially if you're, if you're, the more senior you become, and this is just my personal belief, that the more senior you become, the more you have to be very careful about displays of anger because it, it has such a debilitating effect on on the people that you're actually trying to you know inspire and motivate so and i had those moments not as, i don't remember too many as chairman I, because i was very cognizant of of the risk of that but um but throughout my career you know i mean there were just times when i'd come home and i'd tell Dini, boy I, you know i had this cat i had this captain today and you know, he had, he made a mistake and backed his tank into a 5,000 gallon fuel truck, <coughs> you know, and uh, she said, well, what'd you do? And I said, well, the first thing I did is kick the waste paper basket halfway across the room. And then I had a, you know, and then I was yelling at him and, you know, I was just, you know, I mean, I guess that were you, but, but um, in terms of mistakes at the most senior level, you know, I think it's, it's, I don't have any one particular issue, you know, whether it's Syria or troop levels or Korea. I will say that looking back, I think I spent probably more time on articulating the risks of action than I needed to, and less time articulating the risks of inaction. And I think both are important. So if you're talking to the president about what should we do in Syria, it's easy to get pulled into all the bad things that could happen if you do something. <coughs> but there's also bad things that could happen if you don't do something. And so, you know, there were a couple of, of moments like that with me and the president where I left and I thought, you know what, I don't, I don't think I, I, I did what he needed me to do today. You know, I think I spent too much time focused on the risks of action and not enough on the risks of inaction. So I'm going to uh, finish up with, with one last question, <coughs> which is for uh, our, our, our young alums and, and current students, things, things look pretty bleak right now in terms of their job prospects. Uh, uh, as I've said before, for, uh, for our alumni population, uh, our, our black alumni, our, our alumni of color, uh, the things look bleak. And, um, and so can you, can you give us a sense of, uh, of optimism and a sense of how people can take these really terrible and terrifying times and turn them in a way that, that each of us does what we need to do to, to move things in a positive direction? Well, I sure hope so, and and I, I I spend I spend a lot of time thinking about that myself, and and how I can help the commissioner of the NBA see his path forward, how I can help USA, but how I can help Duke, uh, you know, as we try to figure that out. <clears throat> I I I really do, in my heart, <clears throat> believe that um, we should never waste a crisis, because. And what I mean by that is there are just things that happen in a crisis where you can move the needle a bit, where a lot of the antibodies that would exist if it wasn't a crisis are, are going to be okay about moving the needle in a crisis because it, it, it just seems like the right thing to do at the time. And, you know, and I, you know, I just have to think that this has to be one of those moments. You know, I don't want to, I don't want my grandchildren to be having this exactly the same conversation we're having now, you know, in, uh, the, and, and that I had in, as an 18 year old or actually a 16 year old in um, 1968. I don't want them to have that same conversation. They're going to have a conversation because there'll be other issues, but I don't want it to be the same conversation. So, you know, I, I do, I do think that that would be number one. And I mentioned it's going to take momentum and, and there'll be a tendency for this to wax and wane, and you know, I hope our, I hope our leaders are have enough stamina and energy and interest to keep this thing moving, rather than you know, uh, let it let it dissipate and then we revisit it again in in another couple of years. Um, second, the la not the second, the last thing I'll say in answer to that question, Bill, is you know, there's a 
it's human nature to look for simplicity. When you're confronted with complexity, it's human nature to look for some easy answer. And as one of our presidents, I think, Harry Truman said, it's, you know, for every really hard problem, there's a, a easy and simple solution. And it's always wrong because that simplicity just doesn't address the real complexity. So what, I, what I've been talking with leaders about at, at every chance <clears throat> is this is a time when we ought to be looking for complexity and, and actually embracing it. When you find it, you should feel good about the fact that you found it because now you can do something about it. And, you know, you mentioned at the start, you know, the, the, African, the African-American community, but, but not them uniquely, but prominently, are affected much more deeply by the pandemic, by the economic uh, struggles, and now by these issues of race. So their complexity is far greater than my complexity. And we ought to know that. I mean, we ought to actually not only find it, but we ought to embrace it and we ought to deal with all of it, not just, you know, decide like an a la carte menu. Well, I'll, you know, let's take care of, you know, redistricting or let's take care of police brutality. We got to do that. But it's, it's in the context that it exists in a, in a system that is very complex. And I'm afraid, so I am optimistic that there is a path and that path is to seek embrace and deal with complexity. Um, but we have to watch that we don't convince ourselves that, you know, that defunding the police will somehow solve all the problems. It could actually solve some problems and create an, a completely new set of problems that we're not ready for. So complexity, look for it, embrace it, deal with it. And um, it, by the way, that's hard because again, human nature is, you know, I want the quick, easy, simple solution. There ain't any of those left right now. General Dempsey, thank you so much for advising Duke University, for advising our community, and for being a truly great leader of consequence uh, for our country and for the world. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Bill. God bless, and everybody stay safe.